hard copy should be available in your room. So it, your first thing is make sure you signed in on the attendance sheet at your particular location, but I just want to go through some forms to make sure you have them in hand. So in front of you, you should have the agenda, a copy of the presentation, a team reflection sheet, the SWOT template, your current coalition action plan, a post-event evaluation, and your certificate of attendance. As Sarah said, the phone lines will be muted during the session. And we are hopeful to have question and answers at the end of each of our sessions. So feel free to either type your notes into the chat or write them down and we'll be sure that we can come back to that and we'll be able to answer those. Just so I know that you're all fully present and you feel that you are engaged, always feel free to use that chat function. We will not be offended at all if you barrage us during the talks with additional questions, concerns, or comments. And that's really a great way, since I can't see your smiling faces back at me, it's a great way for me to know that I'm indeed giving you the information that's needed. So right now, we will go ahead and start our presentation. So one of the very first things we want to do is, even though we're not physically there in the room, we want coalitions to go around the table for the next five minutes. And what we want to share with each other is your name, the organization that you're representing, your role within the organization, and I want you to share something unique or rememberable about yourself that others may not know. I also want to ask that when your coalition's done, just let us know in the chat box and then we'll continue. So we're going to take five minutes. So I have it at 916 right now, so by 921 we'll restart with the next. But please go ahead and start your activity within the room. Thanks everyone. Okay, coalition teams, we're going to continue to move ahead just so that we're not falling too far behind, but I just wanted to remind you about our objectives today. Really, it's a review and a celebration of your community's progress and what you developed last year as well as where you have been able to achieve and move forward. We also wanted to share Aurora's journey on palliative care as well as we wanted to provide time at the end of this workshop that you can actually discuss and update your action plans for this next nine months. So your copy of the agenda contains the timeline, but as a reminder, we're opening our workshop with our team reflections for that first 30, 20 minutes before Dr. Chim Jesnick starts presenting at 9.30. We will be aiming for 30 minutes of presentation, about 15 minutes of questions and answers, but I want to keep that pretty fluid since we started late. And after his presentation, we will do some Q&A, but our hope is then we'll continue to go through the rest of the content, and our goal is to sign off by 11, 11, 15, and then you will have work time at that point to work through all the things that we talked about as the presentation. And as a coalition in there, we'll also have you revise your SWOT and your action plan. And our hope is that by 1245, you feel like you can start wrapping that up so that members can leave at one. But again, I want to keep that fluid because each of the coalitions are unique. And if you need to stay and want to stay longer to work on things, by all means, go ahead and do that. It's really a group decision for each coalition. So as a, another reminder, really our initiative today is our goal really is to assist rural communities in establishing, and for us it's more strengthening those palliative care programs. And we're doing that by bringing the communities together in a structured approach and really focusing on that community capacity and the development. We're back to a team reflection next. And this is a time that you may have flip charts in your room, and we want, again, however you would like to do this as a coalition, you can use the flip charts and have a volunteer record the responses from the group. You also have the Wisconsin Rural Palliative Care Team Reflection Form, and it has the same questions for your reference, but we want you to take the next five minutes, and I want you to, as a coalition, brainstorm and record your responses. 
again, I do need to encourage you to record those responses because that's the information we'd like to see back here at Metastar so we know what your thoughts are. Again, coalitions, when you're done, please let us know in the chat function. It is 924 right now. So you have your five minutes for some work time. Thanks everyone, and I'll let you begin. Okay, coalitions, I know I'm probably interrupting you in the heat of discussion. So I'm sorry to do that, but in lieu of time, I'm going to continue to move forward. But just know, you can come back to this team reflection and continue to talk about it, even when we sign off on the webinar portion, because it's a great way to just start talking about where you're at and what potentially you may be looking at in the future with it. This is also one of the items that we sent through, because we know team and program development is on a continuum. And while many skills can be used for coalitions, this slide is actually specific to palliative care, and it's provided by our partners at Stratus Health. The table breaks building, evolving, and thriving down into the categories that you see, there being leadership, clinical team, palliative care skills, advanced palliative care planning progress or processes, community palliative care awareness, coordination of care and collaboration with community services and support, and the availability of palliative care. Now, I'm going to give you some five more minutes again, so I would like you to take a little time as your coalition, review the slide or the document, and then decide where you fall as a coalition for each one of the categories. And again, I'm going to ask that you let me know in chat if you're done before the five-minute mark. And the time I have right now is 9.31. I'll be checking back in the next five minutes. Thanks, everyone. And again, if you have questions, concerns, feel free to send a message to Sarah at the Metastar individual, and we'll be able to address them for you. Okay, coalitions. I know that you're still discussing, which is wonderful but I wanted to make good use of our time. And at this point, I'd like to introduce Dr. Jelnick, who is a palliative care medicine physician with Advocate Aurora Health. He is the project owner for advanced care planning, shared decision-making, and serious illness project. He's board certified in palliative care and family medicine. He is the co-founder and president of the Palliative Care Network of Wisconsin and a member of the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Care Medicine and the American Academy of Family Physicians. Dr. Desnick received his doctorate of osteopathy from Kirksville College of Osteopathic Medicine in 1994 and his Bachelor of Science in Exercise Physiology from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 1990. He is a clinical adjunct assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health. He has presented both locally and nationally on topics of palliative care, pain management, advanced directives, and end-of-life care, and participated in numerous initiatives related to these topics. Again, we're going to collect questions in the chat box, and we'll address them at the end. Dr. Jesnick, the floor is now yours. Thank you very much, uh, and thank you to you all, not only for attending this morning, but for all your fantastic work. Um, it's, it's really inspiring and, and fantastic, so thank you all. Um, so, so congratulations to you all. Uh, also congratulations and thank you to Stratus Health and Metastar and Deanne and Janelle and everyone for uh, organizing this, but doing all, all this great work. Um, you know, re reflecting a little bit about uh, about this morning and what you all are doing, you know, as, as a recovering family physician uh, and a family physician that did his training up in Wausau and then my palliative medicine fellowship in Marshfield and and uh, using uh, your services up in Taylor County with my mom a year and a half ago, the, the the work that you all do is incredible and it's it's much more difficult in the rural areas. So I really do commend commend you all. So what I want to do this morning is really share uh, our journey at Aurora West Dallas Medical Center. West Dallas is just west of, of Milwaukee, um, and and share some information, share data, kind of share our story. But my, my hope is that 
you all on the phone can kind of look at this and say, wow, you know, their burning platform is really similar or exactly to the same as ours. And wow, yeah, we need to do similar communication training for our clinicians. Um, wow, this data will be helpful to our C-suite administrators too, just as it was for West Dallas. So please, as you're, you're listening to this, think, think about this at, through that lens. Um, so, so for today, the really learning objectives are to, to describe barriers and opportunities for hospital systems change. Um, and what we'll talk about is not only how to improve palliative care services for patients from a specialty perspective, but also what we call primary palliative care uh, services. Uh, we'll also look, uh, I'll list some key steps to, in designing a new system of care. We'll talk about what that system part really means which will include hospital standards, staff education, uh, uh, your electronic medical record changes needed, and also how do we really involve the quality team um, to, to, to monitor our improvement or lack thereof. And then lastly, develop an action plan for starting a, a generalist palliative care initiative. So just a little bit more about uh, our hospital and our system. Um, Aurora Healthcare is quite big. Uh, we got bigger when we merged with Advocate out of uh, Illinois. Um, we have 16 hospitals on the Wisconsin side. 13 of those hospitals actually have palliative care uh, clinicians or programs. My hospital specifically is the second largest hospital within the system. Even though it's 350 beds, it's basically 140 med surge beds. Uh, so still pretty good sized hospital, but still considered a community hospital in general. And I've been um, providing specialty palliative care here at West Dallas uh, with my team since 2010. So for our hospital, and I'll speak specifically for our hospital, the burning flat, burning platform for us at least, was we kept seeing case after case after case where you know patients were dying in the ICU and we we're doing everything for patients full code the whole works until the very end and find out well maybe the patient didn't want such aggressive care and basically you know for, for the quality folks we, we were seeing deaths that were associated with failures to plan failures to rescue and failures to communicate so our guts and our eyes were seeing these trends again and again and again um, we, we finally decided we have to do something about it. Um, the other part which is really striking to us was that for the patients that died in our hospital, uh, very few folks actually had advanced directives. Very few folks actually had a conversation and then documentation of those conversations. So for us, that's what prompted action. As a, as a hospital and as a leadership team, you know, we could have provided some lectures we could have provided some grand rounds. We could have, you know, provided emails to folks. But it became very clear that education by itself was not going to make a big difference. We decided we really needed to have a new system. We had to re really do this well, even though it's going to take a little bit longer. So for us, it really became a three-year project. Three years is a long time, right? But we knew this going into, in, into this work that this wasn't going to be a quick fix. If we really wanted to look at the root of the problem, if we really wanted to fix the problem and have some sort of sustainability. So our three-year project really was to improve care for seriously ill patients, right? Um, it's not providing palliative care for all patients, but provide improved care in general for seriously ill patients with the hope that we'd be able to improve patient satisfaction, reduce some of those ICU deaths that were so rampant, um, hopefully in impact uh, inpatient mortality overall, and then maybe get folks where they wanted to go. In a lot of cases, it's hospice. So we, we assumed we'd have an increase in hospice referrals also. So I, I don't, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir. Um, you know, is palliative care benefit, beneficial? Well, heck yeah, it is, right? We, we all knew this. Uh, we know this. Um, the question is, do our hospital leaders know this? Do our clinic leaders know this? Do the clinicians see palliative care as beneficial? So this slide alone really can be helpful and can open some eyes as we say, hey, you know, palliative care as a specialty does a lot of different things, and there's evidence to back this up. We know we help with symptom burden, you know, pain, constipation, dyspnea, anxiety, depression, those type of things. Uh, we know we improve patient and family satisfaction. 
Um, I, I like to say I like, like to say it's because Tim is such a great, great guy, and everyone likes Tim, and other people like me. Um, and maybe that's true to a small degree, but really, what what we provide is patient centered care. We we meet patients, we meet families where they are. That's what we're trained to do, and it's that that skill is not limited to just palliative care specialists. This is something that can that that at least that approach to care can be provided elsewhere. We know from studies we reduce ICU days, we reduce inpatient mortality and readmissions. Several studies out there that show that we reduce cost, you know, 200 to $600 per hospital day uh, post consultation. Uh, recent studies show that we can save $8,000 per Medicare patient um, by our approach and, and what we and how we deliver care and how we change care. And there has been a study, including uh, a New England Journal study, that shows that we can actually help uh, with survival uh, rates. So I, I briefly mentioned this before, this patient-centered approach. And for some, it's, it's a nice phrase. Hey, we're going to provide patient-centered care. You should come to our hospital or come to our system or come to our clinic. When I talk about a patient-centered approach, really what I'm looking at is that systems change. And it's really a culture change. And as simple and as basic as this is, our hope is that we can provide care where all patients are assessed, for, are assessed for their needs and then assisted accordingly, right? What is it that this patient needs? Let's meet them where they are. A majority of the care for those patients and their families really can be met by generalists. What do I mean by generalists? Well, it's the primary care doc. It's the primary care APC. It's the home nurse. It's the specialty cardiologist. It's the hospitalist. It's the ED doc with some special communication training and other training a great majority of that care can be provided, be provided by those generalists. And then when the case gets complicated, there's conflict, there's unresolved symptoms, um, there's conflict either within the family or within the medical team, that's the time that you can bring in a palliative specialist, a palliative team to take care of those folks. Um, as everyone on the phone knows, uh, palliative care specialists are, are are not rare, but there's not a lot of us. Uh, clearly not, en not enough of us to care for all the patients needed, so we really do need help. So to, so to, to, to really kind of reemphasize this point, this is a, uh, a journal of palliative medicine article or an abstract uh, that discussed the prevalence of inpatients uh, at 33 different hospitals that were appropriate for palliative care, but also who were receiving palliative care. And what we found, and actually this abstract is very consistent with other papers out there, basically 20% of all folks admitted to any of your hospitals today will be deemed appropriate for a palliative care referral or at least will have some sort of palliative care need, whether it be the need for a goals of care discussion, the need for pain and symptom management, um, unresolved issues and things like that. But of the 20% of patients that were deemed appropriate for referral, only 40% received a palliative care referral. Only 40% of that 20%, right? So the conclusion of the abstract was that findings demonstrate the need to expand the availability of a palliative, a palliative delivered by frontline providers. Palliative care specialists will always, always be needed. But we know nationwide we're about 4,000 to 8,000 palliative specialists short. We need help, and this is where the frontline providers uh, can help in that area. So I, I mentioned this just a little bit. You know, when we decided that we we needed a new system, we needed to change how we delivered care at Aurora Rosales Medical Center. Again, education by itself is not enough. Uh, a webinar like today is fantastic, but just education by itself, they say, is probably only 30% effective. So if we really want to improve outcomes, if we really want to improve the quality of care for our patients, improve the safety of the care for our patients, we really need to involve system changes. And I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more later. I'm um, sorry about the for formatting of, of this slide, but uh, the slide is really just uh, is a reminder that key conversations are imperative and that one conversation is not enough. You know, we, we consider, at least in the palliative world, that, that the conversation is our skill. That's our tool, just like a surgeon does surgery. Um, the emphasis, though, is that depending on where a patient is along their trajectory, uh, early on what we call category one conversations 
uh, need a, needs a skilled provider to do that. Usually uh, first steps training, facilitator training by social workers, nurses work really, really well, chaplains. The next step's really more for chronic disease. Uh, you still need advanced care planning, you still need first steps, advanced directive type discussions. But these are folks that really have, you know, been diagnosed with moderate COPD or advanced heart failure or stage two cancer or early onset dementia. That's a different conversation. That's the discussion that really needs to, where we need to discuss goals of care, code status, who's gonna be your decision maker and so forth. So forth. And then really category three conversations is really for folks that have one to two years of life to live. Again, a different conversation. This is where our clinicians really need to be involved talking about prognosis and talking about medical treatment and what's possible and not possible. So this is just a, a reminder that communication is a skill. It's a learned skill and needs to be trained. So for, for the training uh, that we did at West Stylus, uh, basically we tried small group training. Initially the, the training was seven hours. We've since reduced the training to about five hours per, per session. Uh, for one session. Uh, during that time, it's, it's, it's just fascinating as you start talking to clinicians and folks in a smaller group and start talking about, you know, why is it difficult to have these conversations? You know, how do we di differentiate our personal attitudes versus professional attitudes as we start having these, these discussions? It's amazing the feedback we get from folks. Um, so that part really during the communication training is imperative. Uh, the majority of it, but of the time is spent with role playing where you can actually work on skills, uh, what words work, what words don't work, um, and really giving folks a chance to practice in a safe environment how to have these conversations. And part of, part of uh, the training is also didactic work. You know, let's talk a little bit about prognostication, what that means. You know, it's not just time, it's also function. Talk about advanced directives 101, why it's important, why patients need this, and how clinicians can be uh, crucial as far as recommending getting those done. And then obviously ethical and legal issues, especially when it comes to the state of Wisconsin. Uh, again, this is just really more of the uh, of the agenda and what we discuss. Again, a lot of the didactic work, a lot of family goal setting, um, and you know we use the spikes mnemonic. This is just what we chose to use as a basis and a format for how to have these discussions. Uh, to do uh, some conflict management. What if people get mad at us? Haven't forbid. Uh, or what if there is conflict among uh, care providers and so forth? We discuss that and work through that, and then also discuss code status discussions. You know, as, as a family practice doc and a resident, I never had training on how to have a code status discussion. Uh, and it's imperative to do just that because uh, it really can impact care. So initially at West Dallas, um, this was about five years ago, um, you know, how, how did we get this up and going? Well, we, we had several meetings with our medical exec executive team. Uh, so we had uh, meetings with C-suite, hospital administration, but also uh, medical staff leadership. Uh, we pressed upon them saying, hey, we have a spurting platform. Here's all these folks dying in the ICU. We're not seeing a lot of goals of care discussions. Uh, we think we can provide better, safer care. What we'd like to do is provide uh, communication training for our clinicians in the hospital to see if this doesn't improve those numbers and provide better care. Um, so initially, we tr we uh, trained a lot of the medical exec committee members, and believe it or not, you know these leadership folks for our hospital. Every single one volunteered to be part of this first training group. Um, I was really floored, but really I shouldn't have been because these are leaders saying this is important. Um, for us, that was key. You know, training the medical medical staff president, president, the director for oncology, the director for primary care, uh, hospitalist medical director, and so forth, for them to go through the course see what was involved and see how important this is. When I went back to them again saying, hey, we'd like to do another course, they said, absolutely, how much money do you need and when are you gonna do this? Uh, so with that support, today we've trained more than 325 hospitalists, ED docs, other specialists. We've reached out to uh, skilled nursing facilities and trained APCs. Uh, we've trained case managers, CNSs, and other folks within the hospital, in the outpatient setting, nursing home, and obviously the hospital setting. So what do folks say? Um, well, first off, nobody likes uh, uh, a training like this, uh, especially not to sit down and talk and have a, a other people watch us. Um, so some folks said, yeah, every clinician should go, th should go through this. 
Um, you know, they make comments about how it takes time to practice different words and find and find words that really work. Uh, my favorite, of course, is I hate role play, but I have to admit it is the only way to learn and how to do this better. Um, that might have been my quote, I can't say for sure, but that's definitely a sentiment that we hear from uh, folks again and again, is they hate role playing, but it works really, really well. A little bit about logistics, I mentioned it before. Um, we went um, really top down initially from the medical exec committee, but also worked with uh, hospital leaders. Um, we trained as many folks as we could. Uh, we had funding split between the hospital side and the medical staff side, which was key. The hospital saw the value in training like this because of the outcomes that would, would uh, be produced, um, but the medical staff saw it as well, so they helped with uh, funding for this. And then we came up with the CME uh, credits for the communication training for the docs. Uh, a key piece of this, again, this is a skill. Uh, we would think to train somebody how to uh, put in a central line and say, good luck, you did it once, go forward and you know, do it as much as you, as you can. Uh, we thought mentoring folks in this new skill is really important. So at least at our hospital, we had two one-hour mentoring sessions with the clinicians to say, hey, let's go have a discussion together. You lead and we'll talk about it afterwards. We created a goals of care template for our electronic medical record that can be used. So once you have this great discussion, you have a place to document the discussion. And we had quality really help out with chart reviews. How are we doing as far as the, the presence of goals of care discussions? And ultimately, what is the quality of those notes? Did they just said I had a goals of care discussion that was really, really good? Or did we actually talk about prognosis and patient-centered goals and plan for future deterioration? Uh, so that was key as far as the accountability piece and the quality piece. The systems change piece, I mentioned that before, you know, the quality group is, is fantastic. You know, our, our quality department was key with all this and they totally get it. So if you're not friends with your quality department, please do so. Um, part of what we looked at is, is um, kind of insistence, the culture change. Well, all patients should have some sort of a goals of care discussion, specifically for sick patients and ICU patients. Um, the goals of care template we had embedded into the chart. Uh, for, the, for specifically for the hospital submissions, so they would use it on a regular basis. Uh, as I mentioned, quality department would review the charts, look for quality, see how, see how well we are doing from that perspective. And we developed the weekly mortality review committee to look for opportunities for improvement from a system perspective. And one of our quality metrics was the presence or absence of goals of care discussions. We also started working with other groups, uh, care coordination-wise. We work with the nursing homes because they are also concerned about quality of care and goals of care discussions, especially sending patients back to the hospital. We work with our ED staff as they're having these, discuss this, these discussions all the time. And we actually developed a DNR bracelet project because we saw that on one of our floors, only 30% of our DNR patients, or do not resuscitate patients, actually had a purple bracelet in the hospital. So that was one of our quality improvement projects that came from, from this work. So how, how can I do this at my institution, whether it be a hospital, clinic, or nursing home? Number one, you have to show that there's a problem. If you think that there's a lack of goals of care discussions at your facility, pull 10 charts and see if that's really the case. If you think that you're not getting enough, having enough advanced directive discussions or documents done, pull the charts to see if, you know, how, how you're doing. Uh, but gather data, uh, then meet with the C-suite. Hey, here's our burning platform C-suite, CMO, CNO, hospital president. We think this is an issue. Here's a plan um, of, uh, of really trying to improve care, which would involve the education, which involved system, would involve systems changes, um, but also potentially mortality review process. So these are all things that you, you can do at your institution. Find your partners, right? Every institution, every clinic, every nursing home is different. Who are your leaders? But more importantly, who are your champions? Who gets this? Who's been saying this for a while and just ha they haven't had really good support? Um, you'd hope it would be hospital leadership. You'd hope it would be medical staff leadership to understand this as an issue. Uh, it might have to be risk, right? Um, we want to make sure we're providing safe care for our patients. But if you're having a, a repeated safety events, serious safety events specifically, this is an opportunity to, to address those safety events. So sometimes risk are the folks that can help us out too. Again, top-down support, bottom-up is important, but you have to have leadership support. 
number one, to help create and effect change to find funding, but also support and accountability. Um, having leadership actually take, take the communication course is, is huge, so they can see it firsthand. Um, they, they'll be your biggest fans after that. Again, mortality review is huge. Strategic planning, again, this is not a one-day thing. This might be a three-year process, as I mentioned, but to be thinking through what that might be is, is really, really important, uh, and then gather as much data as possible. And really the dream is, you know, how, how can patient-centered care really be the norm and not just a cool phrase that's all warm and, and fuzzy, right? How can we really provide patient and family-centered care versus the clinician-centered care, which is really the norm? How do we do this? But isn't that a great uh, goal to set? Um, how can we make sure that goals of care um, conversations are completed and then documented for all appropriate patients? You can define who your appropriate patients are. Um, we're still working on that, honestly, from our side. But is it all ICU admissions? Is it stage four cancer patients? Is it severe COPD patients? Um, is it patients with three admissions in three months with shortness of breath? You can define who those folks are. But how can we make sure that that's part of the standard, that's part of right care for our patients? Um, maybe you, you look at goals of care conversations as a credentialing requirement. I had one hospital leader saying, hey, this is my hospital. Uh, we can determine what best care, right care is for this hospital. If clinicians want privileges here, this is what they need to do. So it's not a power trip by any means, but it's, you know, we want to make sure care being provided at our facility is the same care we want for our, our own family members, right? So to insist and put that much emphasis is key. And then ultimately, the, the ultimate goal with all this from a data perspective is are we providing care that's concordant with a patient or family's wishes? that we provide the right care for that patient, whether it's super aggressive care, whether it's more comfort care, or somewhere in between. Uh, th this is just a reminder also that um, through the Palliative Care Network for Wisconsin, we did provide a guidebook or create a guidebook about our West Dallas story, um, really talks about how we planned all this, the struggles, the barriers we have, but also uh, a lot of the data. And, and just in the last uh, couple of minutes, I, I did, this is older data, but I want to show you the effect that goals of care training, systems change work, a mortality review process, and data gathering really did for our hospital. So between January of 2014 to 2015, uh, we gathered this data. Uh, we're very, very pleased about it. So during that period of time, with all the systems change, we saw a decrease in inpatient death. We saw a decrease in, uh, in the number and the percentage of ICU deaths, which is one of part of our burning platform to, to begin with, right? Uh, we saw that our uh, nursing home to hospital readmissions decreased. We saw that our code, code four calls decreased by 50%. So folks that coded, that coded uh, on the floor, those code calls decreased by 50%. But at the exact same time, our stat team calls hey, this patient's blood pressure is getting worse, their heart rate is dropping, we need help quick, those stat team calls double. So we are no longer coding no-code patients, but we're also rescuing patients sooner and quicker. We also notice that our hospice referrals increased. Is the purpose of this to save money and send as many people to hospice as possible? Of course not. But if the care that a patient wants is more of a comfort care approach or more of a hospice approach, let's get them to hospice as opposed to staying on a ventilator in the ICU for 14 days. Uh, we did see some HCAP improvement scores, especially from communication. Um, it was iffy at best, but we did see some trends in that direction. We clearly saw more goals of care discussions, and we increased our advanced directives as well. More specific numbers, um, our hospital deaths decreased by 27%. So way back in 2013, 2014, while our discharges increased, our percent of de deaths in our hospitals decreased by 27%. And that reduction has been consistent for the last five years. We also saw a 27 point increase in advanced directive completion. Initially, for patients that died in our hospital, only 50% had an advanced directive on file. That bumped up to 77%. We also saw a decrease in restraint usage because we identified goals a little bit better, but also just so you all know, we also saw a decrease in uh, palliative medicine consults. 
Why is that? Well, we got more uh, specialty specific consults versus this patient needs to be transferred to hospice. Um, but we also saw our primary care clinicians and hospitalists doing more of these discussions on their own. So with that, I will pause and open uh, all this to, to questions. J just know that um, this process was long. It took a lot of time and effort and buy-in. It was not perfect by any means. Um, I was told by my quality director way back when that it does take three to five years for culture change, and it clearly did take that long. Um, so the take-homes are that this work is really important. Um, this type of patient-centered care and goals of care discussions is really the care we'd want for our own family members. So we should provide that for our patients and their families as well. Um, and you have to be patient in it, uh, along the way. Thank you, Dr. Jesnick. I know Sarah just checked and didn't see any questions in the chat box, but remember, if you're not seeing the chat box open, go to the lower right-hand side of the screen. You'll see the word chat and hit the downward arrow. And let us know if there are any questions you have or if you need a phone line open. We do have a question for you from the Oneida Coalition, Dr. Jesnick. How did you get buy-in from specialty services such as ortho and surgery? Um, great question. Um, so, so the, the buy-in piece is huge, um, and, and we've kind of learned from our from our own mistakes. But you know, just as we wanted to meet the hospital folks where they were and kind of presented this burning platform. Um, we did the same thing with surgery. Uh, we haven't worked as much with orthopedic surgery, but honestly, talking to them, meeting them where they are, and really talking to surgery, hey, you know, are you having goals of care discussions? What are your struggles? What, uh, what, what are the barriers to having this? They get this. They say, listen, we have these discussions all the time. We see patients that we don't think are going to do well in, in surgery and may, may, may likely die, but we, we don't really have the skills on how to have these goals of care discussions to really talk about prognosis and to really do this and do this well. So honestly, that was one of our biggest surprises when we did the very first course was that we had several surgeons, including the chief for orthopedic surgery and the chief for general surgery, saying, sign me up. We have these all the time, but we have to do this in a short period of time. Can you give us some skills on how to do that? So, again, meeting them where they are. Um, if we want to do it with patients and families to do this with clinicians also. And um, we're, we're pleasantly surprised by the responses we get from them. Another question that came in from the Green Lake and Washira Coalition. Did you tie any compensation for physicians or providers to the quality results? Uh, another great question. We, we did not. Um, initially, when we did, did this training, uh, at least the training piece, it was during their work time. So it was, it was expected that they would go. After that, with support from medical directors for the hospital service and others, they encouraged um, their clinicians to go very strongly, and they basically complied. Uh, but no, we, we, to this point, we have not provided compensation, compensation for this. So in lieu of compensation for improvement is really sharing data with folks, but also sharing stories. Um, too often, we as clinicians hear about the downside. We messed up on this. We didn't do a good job with that. But to share the good stories is, is wonderfully powerful. Hey, after this communication training, this hospitalist had, the, and this is a true story, had, a, had the goals of care discussion with the family and basically decided that they needed to withdraw care. Um, and afterwards, this hospitalist walked out of the meeting with a big smile on his face. And I said, what's going on? You just told them their loved one was going to die and we're, we're going to withdraw care. And he said, well, I got this big hug from the daughter. Um, you know, she, she, you know, that was great. She gave me a hug, even though I gave bad news. And they ask good questions, and then they get mad at me for giving bad news. And we basically talked about what everyone is thinking, and it just made that much easier. So even if we don't have a financial compensation of some sort, if they have, if they have a skin in the game, boy, I want to provide better care as a clinician. I want to see better care for my patients in general, and I want to see this hospital thriving. Um, that, it, it's a, a good compensation just in general, and we know uh, clinicians that do this better have less burnout and more job satisfaction. So it's, it's not money compensation, but it's, it's compensation. 
Your next question is, are there specific policies that support your work that you would suggest be implemented? For example, non-indicated medical intervention. Uh, boy, that's another great question. So, so, so when, when I think about policies, how do we hardwire this from a hospital perspective? Um, you know, how can a hospital support work like this? And it clearly you don't want to be too heavy handed, but you want to provide good care. So, so I guess a couple thoughts. Number one is this is where a medical staff can insist that goals of care are part of right care, are part of the right care for, for patients. And we went as far with support from our medical exec committee to say just that. Honestly, they didn't carry a lot of power or weight because they were just words and we didn't have a plan for accountability, but they bought into the premise. Um, you know, are, are there, is there other, are there other ways policy-wise or reinforcement-wise to, to, to really work with this? Well, I think this is where the mortality review committee really comes in. With, you know, we've been doing chart reviews for, since 2014 for every single death in the hospital looking for opportunities for improvement from a system perspective. As we start seeing trends that, boy, this patient had surgery and died two days later, this is the fifth case we've seen this year. That gives us the data, gives us the background to say, well, let's work on a quality improvement project. Let's find, do a common thread analysis of those cases and see what we can do to improve that. Looking at it from a case review perspective and not a one-off, this was just a bad case, but hey, this is a trend, really can reinforce that where you can change behaviors, change outcomes, and, and hopefully not do the same thing again, meaning you know, suggesting a surgery or procedure that's really not indicated or, or necessary. Our next question for you is, how did you socialize this idea initially? How did you then get leadership buy-in for the hours away from the clinic as well as patient care? For example, as it relates to productivity. Uh, great. Um, so it, it, it initially was a lot of planning but getting the right folks at the table. And for us, the right folks was the chief medical officer and the director of quality and then one or two others. You know, they kept seeing that these issues, these burning platforms initially. So to have leadership from that perspective, buying in and saying this is an issue was key. Number two then is gathering docs and nurses that did a bunch of chart reviews. We did a, we looked at our last 50 deaths which really confirmed what our gut told us that, you know, again, you know, we weren't having these discussions, this was an issue. That really kind of helped socialize a lot of this, to, to have, you know, seven docs and seven nurses doing chart reviews, and many of those were leaders within the hospital. They, they saw this was an issue. They saw this, this was a concern. So we got automatic social, socialization and buy-in from them just from the chart review. And then to present again and again and again to different groups, our inpatient committee, the doc, you know, monthly meetings and so forth, for them to hear the issue, the concern, the why we're doing this and here's our intervention. It took some time and some planning, uh, but that type of socializing from a top-down perspective really worked. And then once we got the data, got the improvements, um, some, some improvement data uh, to, to back this up, bottom-up socializing became easier. We got pushed back. I got a lot of clinicians that were not happy with me because we're suggesting that they're not communicating or talking to their patients, right? Um, th th there is going to be pushback. There's going to be problems with that. But the more you can communicate the issue, the more you can communicate the solution, and then share the stories of how this is working well. Um, you you're just going to have some bumps in the road. I still have docs that are mad at me because basically I made them go through this training. Um, so it's not perfect by any means, but I think you can win more folks over by this process and, and them seeing the, the positive result. Dr. Jesnick, how do you socialize and train new physicians and clinicians in palliative care to keep up the standard of care? Um, super question. Um, it's it, this is where this is really where you need the top-down support. If if the director of the hospital is service, if the president of the hospital says, boy, look at this data, look at this culture change that has occurred at our facility, we're going to require all new hires for our hospitalist team. We're going to re require all new hires um, for the nursing floors to go through this type of training is just a basic part of their training that helps immensely because they've already set that standard for folks. That's number one. 
Number two is I think to socialize this through the medical director saying, hey, if, as a member of the, this hospitalist group, goals of care discussions are really important. That's part of our culture. Um, hey, new hospitalist, we expect that you do this. We're going to be doing chart reviews to see how this go, how, how this goes. Again, relationships uh, with not only hospital leadership, but these medical leaders um, is imperative. And then lastly, um, chart reviews, accountability. If we want to consider, continue to say this is the expectation, uh, we want to keep this standard at a high level, um, then you do chart reviews. How often for patients submitted to the ICU was a goal to care discussion? How often did that occur? Um, let's do monthly chart reviews. Let's break it down by docs. Let's break it down by clinicians and specialties. And then, based on that data, report it back to the C-suite, back to the, the leadership folks. Hey, we were doing a pretty good job, but the numbers dropped off. Leaders, you need to know this. How would you like us to proceed? Um, so, so that accountability part, the chart review part, and the insistence that this really is best care for our patients uh, and having backup is important. But that's really a top-down process, but also bottom-up. This is folks on the floor looking for these discussions. Thank you for that response. Um, praises for your presentation also. I want to let you know on that on chat. But there is a question, if you're able to capture any data on whether patient care was more concurrent with their wishes. <laughs> so that, that is a million dollar question, right? And as, as we said, as we set that as a goal, right? Um, we start doing all the literature review and saying, well, how, how do we measure concordant care? How do we make sure that patients are receiving the care that they want? There aren't really good studies anywhere that show this. Now, it depends on what you say is concordant care, right? Do you want to use an advanced directive that says, I want, yes, I want resuscitation, no, I don't want resuscitation? Well, that's something you can measure, right? Um, or, um, yes, I want a feeding tube, no, I don't want a feeding tube. The problem is the documentation of the patient's wishes. So that's really our goal at this point is really to, to narrow down what a patient wants and doesn't want. And then really comparing that discussion and that data from there from the care that's being provided. So again, that's the ultimate goal of making sure that we provide care concordant with the patient's wishes. How do you know what the patient's wishes are? Well, we have to ask. We have to train folks to ask. We have to document this well and gather data. So we're in the process of doing that. Unfortunately, we're kind of figuring out along the way because we don't have a great model. Um, but but yes, that that that's the goal, and we're getting there. So clearly documenting goals of care and then comparing those those charts are, are important. And we're really doing that now with our mortality review process. So we, we want to document the presence of goals of care discussions first, so they're there or not. But then if they do have a goals of care discussion, then we do what they wanted us to do. Uh, and right now it's it's done by hand, but that's that's the the ultimate goal for all our patients. And speaking of that goals of care are you willing to share your goals of care template, or is that something that's already in your 40-page guidebook? Um, uh, yes, I'm willing to share. The initial goals of care template is in that guidebook. We revised it. We actually have a 2.7 version. And the purpose of the 2.7 version, at least for Advocate Aurora Health, we use EPIC. And what we wanted to do is create a goals of care note that not only reflects the patient's wishes, but knowing that not all clinicians are comfortable having these discussions is somewhat prescriptive, where here's a section to document a patient's prognosis, not only time, but also function. And here's where you can document a patient's wishes overall and a plan for future decline. Um, the new 2.7 version is really a way to remind clinicians these are really important parts of a goals of care discussion. Um, please remember to ask all these areas. So yes, our, our very basic goals of care discussion is in the guidebook. The new 2.7 version uh, is out and available, and yes, I'd be happy to share that, that template with folks. Excellent. And for the coalitions, just know that we will gather that information and I'll work with Dr. Desnick so that you can receive that also. Our final question for the presentation is, how did you overcome the concern that providers don't have time to have these conversations? Yeah, <laughs> um, if I only had a dime for every time I heard that. Um, you know, so, so part of, you know, being, being a recovering family doc helped out immensely in a lot of different ways. When I think about those poor primary care clinicians that say just that and rightfully so, 
again, just like we want to meet patients and families where they are, we really want to strive to meet clinicians where they are. So why aren't they having these discussions? Do they think they're important or not? And as we have discussions with primary care clinicians in the clinic and nursing home folks, uh, APCs and docs and otherwise, then hospitalists and specialists, they see the value and goals of care discussions, right? Um, but they are concerned about the time. So part of what we try to look at from a time perspective is, okay, system, okay, uh, Advocate Aurora Health, okay, Aurora West Dallas Medical Center, if you really think this is important that your hospitals have these discussions, we need to make sure they have time to do this. So that really behooves us um, uh, as leaders to really talk to the system, talk to the hospitals, talk to the director saying, if you think it's important, we need to make time for them to have these discussions. And if they don't have time to make the discussions, that's where you say, boy, we have some great palliative providers that'd be happy to do these for you, whether it be an inpatient or an outpatient side. Um, for, for the clinicians in the outpatient setting, that's really, really rough. When you're supposed to see 30 patients a day, or in a half day in some cases, you know, how, how do you make time for that? So again, talking to the powers that be that we have to make time for these clinicians to have these discussions, or at least raise, raise the awareness that discussions are important, and if they can't, here's a referral to palliative care. Here, here's a referral to a, sk a skilled, trained facilitator that can help with this. Um, so it's, it's not easy, but all I know from the hundreds and hundreds of folks we've talked to, they see this as important. If time is built in for them to have these discussions, they will do this. And then once they do this and find that, find that it is rewarding, it is helpful, and have the skills to do this, um, it's, it's, an easier, it's, it's, it's an easier promise, it's an easier task at that point. But um, it, it takes a while to get there. Right now, I'm not seeing any more questions, but I'd personally like to thank Dr. Jessett for his wonderful presentation. And I want to remind members that you can still reach out to him even when we finish today. His email was on his initial slide, but just as a reminder, it's Tim Jessick, J-E-S-S-I-C-K 90 at gmail.com with no space in between there. So thank you once again, Dr. Jessick, and thank you for joining us and sharing the wealth of knowledge of what you've been able to achieve and those bumps in the road as well as those celebrations that you had. Uh, thank you and thank you all. Keep doing all the great work you're doing. Uh, lastly is a plug for the Palliative Care Network of Wisconsin. Um, fantastic uh, resources for you all that's free. Um, MyPCNow.org. Um, so whether it's literature, whether it's um, conversion tables for for narcotics or whatever it is, please use that. We created that the website and all those resources for you all that are doing all this hard work. So keep up the good work. Congratulations and uh, look forward to a future conversation. Yep. I don't Coalition, just to let you know, I did miss some questions that were sent to me um, personally, but I will relay those on to Dr. Jesnick and we'll get your responses back to that. But at this point in time, let's all come back together. And this should look somewhat familiar to you because as we said it before, not all palliative care programs are the same. And if you remember before we started with Dr. Jessick's presentation, we had each coalition decide where they kind of fell into each category. And we know that even if we put, had everybody post for their coalition, you would not fall into the same spots for leadership, the clinical team, palliative care skills, the advanced care planning process, the community palliative care awareness, the coordination care and collaboration with community services and support, as well as the availability of palliative care would look different for each one of you. As, why, as well as we know there's wide variation in how you actually implement and focus on these things. If we looked at advanced care directives, it would look different for each and every coalition and each organization that provides palliative care, as well as your process for discussing those goals of cares, as well as the documentation. We also know that the order sets look different across all settings, and we know that each of you has a different means and ways of providing that professional education and as well as the community education. The Center to Advance Palliative Care developed the following principles to guide programs in clinics, 
home care, nursing facilities, and they include the following bullets of the assess the needs. You really need to talk with your stakeholders on who is doing what and what's already there so that we know what you can build upon or what items that you may need to address. You also need to understand that local environment. That's a really hard one for me as being the outsider. I can't really tell you about your county, but you know your county and you know your resources as well as those stakeholders. The next item is just piloting a program. I'm sure every single one of you heard me in workshop one saying it's one patient, one time, and you evaluate. Just know you don't have to roll out everything in that big swath and do everything. Remember my cookie analogy. Take a bite of the cookie, don't shove the whole thing in your mouth. Also, look at your financial support. What is there financially? We already know it's a challenge within palliative care to actually receive reimbursement for the services provided. But really look at where your supports lie. Also, collect program data. Um, you couldn't see it, but I was doing my cheerleading mode of going yay every time Dr. Jesnick talked about collecting data. It really is one of your first steps and it really helps drive the program if you have that data available and you share it. The next one is that coordination of care. Palliative care is not one person. It is a team. It is a system. So really look at how do you coordinate that care and the resources that are available. And then finally, assure the quality. That was my other woohoo moment when he was talking about really involving quality and quality actually having goals within his own program because the quality helps drive that safe and reliable care. Just like not every palliative care program is the same, the same is true for every coalition. As you can see in the following table on the slide, there are many varying elements, and they include the methods of service delivery, members of the interdisciplinary team, the patient focus, the coordinating of the staff, and these variables in the program structure may be related to actual community capacity. It could also be related to how organizations work together to best support needs and care goals of those complex patients across settings or structured processes to identify gaps and resources that fit how healthcare is delivered in that community. Again, we need to recognize that one size does not fit all. That's why each coalition, you have the ability to make those decisions and decide what's gonna work best for you rather than me give you the cookie cutter, here's what I want everyone to do right now. Based upon the article of standardizing the scale of community-based palliative care model, the descriptions of community-based palliative care demonstrates the variability in team structures, the eligibility, and the standardization across care settings. In 19, er, sorry, not 19, you can still tell I'm trying to change that, and actually it should be 19 and not 2014 as my note says. The Four Seasons Compassion for Life, it's a nonprofit hospice and palliative care organization in Western North Carolina. It was awarded by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services Health Care Innovation Award to expand their existing innovative model to implement, evaluate, and demonstrate palliative care in the United States. The objective of the article is to describe the process and the challenges of scaling and standardizing that model. The four season palliative care model serves patients in both inpatient and outpatient settings by using an interdisciplinary team to address symptom management psychosocial and spiritual care, advanced care planning, and patient and family education. The Medicare beneficiaries who were greater or equal to 65 years of age with a life-limiting illness were eligible for the project. The model was scaled across numerous counties in Western North Carolina and the upstate South Carolina. Over the first two years of the project, scaling occurred into 21 counties with the addition of two large hospitals, 52 nursing facilities, and two new clinics. To improve the efficiency and the effectiveness, 
the palliative care screening referral guide and the risk stratification approach were developed and implemented. Care processes, including the patient referral, the initial visit, were also mapped. This article really describes that interdisciplinary palliative care model in all care settings to individuals with life-limiting illness and offers a guide for risk stratification assessments and mapping care processes that may help palliative care programs as they develop to work and improve. But I did want to highlight the key takeaway items being that one, developing and having that referral guide. Two, really ensuring that you have a workforce development. Develop that risk stratification approach and standardize the care processes, especially when dealing in the areas of patient referral and the initial visit, and also your ongoing care. And finally, monitor quality data using a standardized data collection process. And on the screen and on your handouts, you actually have the link to that article if you would like to read it in its entirety. So what steps can you take to be a successful organization for transformation? There are some things that I wanted to review with this because I know you're all at that point of feeling like, wow, we've been doing this for a year. It's same people working on it, and if you're watching my head, which you can't see, it's, it's nodding back and forth, and I'm slumping in my posture. But I wanted to remind you there are things that you can be looking at to create still a successful transformation. So number one is create that sense of urgency by examining your market, your competitive realities, also identify and discuss crisis and potential crisis as well as opportunities and then create your catalyst for change. In the area of forming a powerful coalition, hey, that's you, by assembling your group with enough power to lead change efforts and also as a result of that, develop the strategies for achieving that vision. Our third step is creating a vision to help direct change efforts and develop strategies for achieving that vision where that fourth step is communicating the vision using every channel and vehicle of communication possible to let others know about your new vision and the strategies. The guiding coalition teaching new behaviors and leading by example. We have, as a coalition, communicated our vision. That may be one of the questions you're asking yourself right now. And if not, it may be an item that your coalition may want to discuss today. Hey, you're thinking there's only four steps. Sorry to bust your bubble. There is even more after that. There's also empowering others by acting on the vision. You need to do that through removing obstacles to change, having change systems or structures that seriously undermine that vision, and encouraging risk taking. I know that's scary in healthcare, but we want to also look at non traditional ideas, activities, and actions. That sixth step of planning for and creating those short-term wins, you want visible performance improvement and recognize and reward the employees involved in all your improvements. Your seventh step of consolidating, ooh, I need to do more of my mouth exercises so I can speak better this morning, is also what you need to produce even more change. So using increased credibility to change those systems, the structures and policies that don't fit the vision. Look at hiring, promoting, developing employees that can implement the vision, and also look at what is in place to help revigorate and get those themes and change agents out there. Then as we hit that final step, is really looking at how do you institutionalize and set those new approaches. That could be creating connections between new behaviors and corporate success. It could also be developing channels to ensure leadership development and succession. Another way may be to look at the team stages. So this may be something that you have seen many times over with forming, storming, norming, and performing. But at this, we want to look at where you are with your own coalition team right now. So I'm just going to give you some reminders. Remember back to workshop one? That's really the stage we were in informing. 
that is the stage which most team members are positive and they're polite. You may have been a little anxious when you came and you haven't fully thought about what the team would do. Where other members may have simply were excited that we're going to work on this task and we're going to move ahead. And as leaders, you played a dominant role at that stage because the team member roles and responsibilities weren't clear. Now, this stage could last for some time as people start to work together and as they make an effort to get to know their new colleagues. So storming is the next part of that. And that's when the team moves into that storming phase where people start pushing against the boundaries established in that forming. This is the stage where many teams fail. I am not saying you're failing. I'm just saying this is the part that's hard for some teams because storming often starts where there's conflict between team members' natural working styles. People may work in different ways and all sorts of reasons, but if differing work styles cause unforeseen problems, they can also result in frustration. Storming can also happen in other situations. For example, team members may be challenged um, by your authority or they may be jockeying for positions as their roles are clarified. Or if you haven't clearly defined how the team will work, people may feel overwhelmed by their workload or they could become uncomfortable with the approach that the coalition's taking. Some may even question the worth of the team's goals and they may resist taking on tasks. Team members who stick with the task at hand may also experience some stress, particularly if they don't have the support of established processes or strong relationships with their colleagues. Gradually, that team moves into the norming stage. This is when people start to resolve their differences, appreciate the colleagues' strength, and respect authorities from the leaders. Now that your team members know each one better, they may socialize together, they're able to ask one another for help and provide constructive feedback. People develop stronger commitment to the team goal and you start to see good progress towards it. There's often a prolonged overlap between storming and norming because as new tasks come up, the team may actually lapse back into behavior of the storming stage. The team will eventually, if not, if you're there, reach that performing stage. And that's where the hard work leads. It's, it's without friction. It's really to reach the achievement of the team's goal. The structures and the processes that you have set up will support this well. And leaders, you can delegate as much as your work so that you can concentrate on developing those team members. It feels easy to be part of the team at this stage, and people will join or won't leave because, it, and if they do, it won't disrupt that performance. At this time, we're gonna take five minutes for the team to decide where you are as a group. And if you turn over your Wisconsin Rural Palliative Care Reflection Sheet, you'll find visuals on that backside of the sheet that will help your coalition decide where you fall today. And again, when you're ready, let us know in chat. And remember that each team's different, so we do not expect the same response. Right now, it's 1043, and we'll check back with you in five minutes. Okay, coalition team, I'm sorry, I, I, you know, and I'm sure I'm gonna continue to apologize all morning to keep interrupting you, but again, just know that you can come back to this if you need to after we're done with the presentation. So as we move into our final year and our final nine months, we're really striving for that sustainability. So I wanted to take a moment to review roles within a team because it's gonna look a little bit different in 2020. That, that leadership and sustainability facilitation will not come so much from Metastar, but it's going to come from your team lead. So let's review really what those roles are. So a facilitator has no vested interest and the role is really to keep the team moving. And really up to the point, it's been Metastar, but your team needs to decide for 2020 who's gonna fill this role. Ideally, it would be an individual organization who's really embedded in your community. Let's compare that to the team lead. Just as it says in the title, they lead the team. In 2020, the team leads will be taking on additional leadership, including setting and leading your meetings, the agendas, as well as distributing material. T 
Team members work outside of the meetings to reach aims and goals and objectives besides attending the meetings. So we want you to remember, because you're looking around the room, thinking back to workshop one, going, hey, there's not as many people here. Well, the one thing I want to highlight is the ideal number for a team to be effective is between six to eight, but less than 10. So if you're seeing those dwindling numbers, I want you to remember this is not a negative, that it really is a positive, smaller numbers, but with the insight as well as the knowledge and expertise will still allow you to move forward as a coalition. So at this point in time, we're gonna give you five minutes of work time also. We want you to go around the room and I want you to validate what is each member's role. And again, if you finish before the five minutes, let us know in chat. So right now it is 1051. We'll open back up in five minutes. All right, coalition members, let's come back together and let's start off reviewing what is a strategic planning process. Well, it's something each coalition did last year during your workshop, and this includes looking at that SWOT. So I just want to take an opportunity to remind you that you look at external analysis. It's actually external opportunities and threats that you had looked at. But then you look at internal. Those are the strengths and weaknesses within your collaborative. And then you put it all together into that fancy SWOT term, and this is a great time to take out your hard copy of your SWOT template. Because after you do the SWOT as a group, that's when you really can start aligning your mission, your vision, your values, what you want to achieve, where you want to go. And that helps then align your aims, your goals, and objectives. So again, each group of your coalition, you're going to repeat the process. Now, you can decide what's going to work best for you. Initially, what we did was we used flip notes and we created flip charts. Or you may just say, you know, instead, since we have a smaller group, let's just brainstorm as a group and share our thoughts and have an individual record that. It's totally up to your coalition. But this is one of those activities I do want you to complete even after I sign off today. Remember, you have that blank copy of that SWOT template in your packet, and your coalition leads has a copy of your workshop one SWOT. So at the end of the day, you can compare and contrast to see if your community SWOT has changed. Action plans are dynamic, they're constantly changing. And the action plans that you're gonna be working on today are for your next nine months as our grant ends in September 2020. So your coalition may decide to add items to your plan, you may decide to abandon items on your plan, you may decide to revise items on your plan, including timelines and measurements, or you may retire completed items. But if you do that, make sure you've collected your measurements to ensure that it was completed. Or you may do, decide to do a combination of any of those four. So last year, we talked about the PDSA, the Plan, Do, Study, Act, and how it's been used very successful for hundreds of healthcare organizations in many countries to improve many different healthcare processes and outcomes. And you do that by asking three questions. What are we trying to accomplish today? How will we know the change is an improvement? And what changes can we make to achieve our aims or goals? Now, during workshop one, we created that plan, and since that time, you have been working on that do portion. We also talked about how to write smart aims, including specific, who, what, when, where, which, why. We also talked about making sure it's measurable, how much, how many, how will I know I've actually accomplished it? And then attainable. Can you really accomplish it? And I'm gonna keep stressing because I'm not in the room with you. This is one of the items I spend a lot of time in workshop one is, is it actually something you can do? And keep that in mind as you look at all your goals. Again, small bite out of the cookie. Don't try to shove everything in the box in your mouth at one time and think you can achieve all of this in your last nine months. Also, be realistic. Which goals 
are ones you're willing and able to work on. Knowing that some of the hardest jobs you ever accomplish actually seem really simple because they were a labor of love or passion. And lastly, timely, tangible. Make sure you have due dates as you're looking ahead. So no matter what's on your plan, we need a measure. And measurements should include either being process or outcome measures. So let's review. Process measures is an activity specifically performed when providing care such as what does a provider have, does the provider have a discussion on the goals of care? Where outcome measures looks more on what happens or does not happen as a result of the process such as documentation in the patient chart. Outcome measures tell us whether the changes being made are leading to improvement, that is, helping achieve the aim. Today I'm asking the coalitions to complete the study or evaluation portion of the cycle. So really, what data do you have? Are you able to compare data to the recommendations, the plans, the goals, as well as what did you learn? What problems did you run into? What were your successes? What were your surprises? Are you satisfied with the results? Do you feel that you could do better? Or if you were to go back last year, would you have done something different? And by revising your action plans, you're entering into the act section. So this is a great opportunity for you to discuss, you know, what changes should we make before that next cycle? What will that next test look like? Do we implement it just with one organization or do we look at something more broadly? And do you plan on maintaining those goals? Maybe you achieve something, but you're thinking, no, we really need to keep focus on this else we're afraid it's gonna fall off to the side. Because ideally, what you're looking at is a new plan. So you're still looking at a PDSA cycle. So at this time, you are gonna be having some work time. So as a total group, you are going to be discussing what aims are still current or if they need to be updated. You can also look at, is this something better that we do as a subgroup? So maybe three members of your group focuses on education. And maybe that three focus on just the community education, where number there three focuses on provider education. It's up to you and your coalition whether you want to accomplish everything as a team or break into those sub-teams. But just know, if you are doing sub-teams, make sure that your objectives are current, as well as you know exactly who's on point, what your timeline, and what your measurements are. So your next steps. You're gonna update and share your coalition revised action plans when you're done. And you're going to make sure that your organization, your own organization that you work for, that you're representing, that you are looking at what is your organization's action plan to help support that. Because we know our work is not done. We still have opportunities for improvement. So as a reminder, you have some decisions to make. So when I sign off today, you are gonna do your SWOT analysis, you are going to update your action plans, but it doesn't end there. You will also need to make decisions and decide who is going to set up the times and places of when you're gonna meet and the frequency of the meetings, who's gonna develop the agendas, who's gonna communicate the meeting information, who's gonna facilitate, who's gonna be your minute taker, as well as who's going to send out the items and ensure that follow-ups completed. You also need to make some decisions on how. So how are you going to communicate with your coalition members? Are you going to invite new members where it's appropriate? And how are decisions going to be made? Is this just a voting or whoever's on that subgroup, they're going to make the recommendations and move forward, or is the whole coalition going to do that? How are you going to ensure that action plans are followed through? And how are you going to promote your joint efforts with your organizations and your community? And finally, how are you going to celebrate? because we are in healthcare. We keep considering that we went into this because we wanted to help people.
but we also need to remember that we need to take that time to celebrate the successes that you've already achieved and what's in front of you in the future. So your team lead will collect your evaluations for workshop two and send me input, but I want to remind you and the conclusion is that be strategic and plan for that sustainability. That we are indeed looking at additional opportunities for additional grants in the future, both with Stratus as well as PC Now. Even looking at the fact that can we replicate Aurora's education, and is that something that we can look for grants to do? <coughs> Sorry for the cough. <coughs> No, I'm not infectious, it's just me talking too long. But we also want you to celebrate the impact you've had made on the individuals in your community and also determine when your coalition is going to meet in 2020. We provided you with a number of resources that are available here that you can certainly use. But also, I want to give an opportunity to to answer questions, but before I do that, I also wanted to take a moment to introduce my coworker, Julie Schmelzer, who will also be supporting this project in 2020. So I included her email on this slide. So as we move forward, I'm gonna check chat one more time. I'm not seeing anything. I'm looking at Sarah and I'm not seeing her indicate that there's anything. Any questions for me before I sign off today? And I'm gonna give you a little time because I'm sure you may be discussing it and letting somebody know who's at the actual computer to type what that question may be. I'm not seeing any come up or any requests in chat to open up the phone line. So I am going to believe that you have everything you need to be successful as you continue to meet with your coalition. Again, you can decide when, if after we sign off, if it's a good time for a break and or when you're gonna take a break and how long you're gonna work. But just know the leads in the room do have access to me through email as well as can either call or send me a text if there's questions or concerns or you get stuck. So I wish you the best as you work through, but in closing, I wanna thank each of you for your dedication, your support on expanding rural palliative care. It's been an honor and a pleasure working with you, and I hope today's presentation has inspired your coalition and allows you to explore that next phase of improvement. In closing, bye everyone, and I know you're gonna have great success as you update your SWATs and your plans.